Hello, hello. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, good evening or good morning, wherever you are in the world. I see our attendees loading here on the attendees list. Thank you very much, you all, for joining us. Uh, and welcome to this academics and admissions joint webinar. My name is Federico Menino, and I'm part of the global admissions team at Schwarzman Scholars. And I'm very, very glad to be joined today by two very dear colleagues of mine in the New York office uh, and members of the academics team, Joan Kaufman, who's Senior Director of Academic Programs at Schwarzman Scholars, and Sheila Crowell, Academic Officer. Thank you so much, guys, for joining us. And if you could say a few words about who you are and uh, why you're here and that I'm giving you work to do. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, welcome, everybody. It's so nice to have so many people interested in the academics of the program. Uh, I'm Joan Kaufman. I'm the Senior Director uh, for Academics, as uh, Federico has mentioned. Um, I joined the program in the first year of the program um, when the first cohort uh, arrived. We're now in year four, uh, so I've seen it all. And um, I'm also on the faculty at Harvard Medical School. My own area of expertise is global public health, a topic that's of interest right now to the whole world. Uh, so welcome, everybody. Hi, everyone. I'm Sheila Kroll. I'm the Academic Officer for Shores and Scholars. I work primarily on faculty governance and curricular planning uh, with a background for myself in education policy and China studies. Excellent. Thank you both again so much for joining uh, all of us today. We have a big audience. So today's session, before we begin, is part of a series of thematic webinars uh, that the admissions team is hosting. Uh, in collaboration with alumni and staff members from our various teams and Schwarzman scholars throughout this uh, new online through this new online uh, initiative we which we launched uh, we were very excited to launch last week we hope to present our program from multiple angles and perspectives that are not uh, always available to an outside audience uh, this is an opportunity for a broad external audience of prospective candidates students and young leaders from around the world to get to know a little bit more about um, what it takes to bring this unique program to life uh, and to so that you can get to know a little bit of other people who work tirelessly uh, to make this program a reality. So last week we had a very exciting webinar co-hosted with alumni and members of the student life team in Beijing uh, and in the upcoming weeks uh, we'll host additional joint webinars with representatives from the careers team, alumni engagement and development. So if you haven't done so yet uh, I strongly recommend you to please visit our website, check our full schedule of webinars, and sign up. Uh, so before we begin today, I just want to make sure that everybody's hearing and seeing us well. And I would like to take a few seconds uh, to check the audio. If you can hear as well, please use the raise hand button there. Thank you very much. I can see lots of hands popping up on the screen. Thank you. Uh, another quick reminder, the chat box will be disabled to attendees today. Uh, we will be, if you, if you want to ask questions, please target your questions to the Q&A box that you should see on your screen. And we would advise you to wait until the end of our uh, initial presentation to, um, to direct your questions. And we'll, we'll promise that we'll try to answer all of them. And if not all of them are covered and answered today, uh, I'll make my commitment here to answer them uh, on another time by email. All right, so I guess, I hope you all can see my, the agenda. Um, is everybody want, seeing this, the screen I'm sharing? Ch Sheila? John? Yes, yes, Good. can see it. <laughs> so without further ado, I just want to welcome everyone again and give you a quick overview of what we, we plan to cover during this session. In the next 10 minutes or so, Joan and Sheila will give a very introductory overview and presentations of the main highlights of the program. Uh, and we'll then move to a conversation about the academic experience at Schwarzman College. And then we'll end up with a few reminders about our admissions process. Uh, we're very excited that next week, just in about uh, one week, we're in a one week countdown now for the US and global application launch next week. So, and then we'll open for questions. Uh, we'll have quite a, a lot of time in the end of the session to address your questions. So, John and Sheila, the mic is yours. Thank you very much, guys, again. 
Thank you very much, Federico. So let me provide a brief overview of the uh, curriculum and of the uh, master's degree in global affairs, which is what our program is about. Uh, first of all, we uh, started the program. It was launched in 2016. It's really a unique program. Uh, it fills a niche, which is really about uh, a, the need for a greater understanding of China in global affairs. Uh, China, of course, is a rising, or you could say risen, global power. And um, our program is really focused on training future global leaders who throughout their careers can serve to deepen understanding between China and other key global actors. Uh, so, uh, you know, for us, the um, program, um, what I do need to say is that this program is, is um, based at Tsinghua University, which is China's leading university. Some people could say Beijing University might be, but it's one of the top two for sure. Um, it's therefore a very rigorous academic program. Tsinghua is a hard university to get into for Chinese students, and it's a tough place. It's a demanding and rigorous academic experience. Um, our program, um, we have our newly built Schwarzman College, and most of our teaching is done in-house in English, although Tsinghua University itself has 21 English language master's programs. The degree comes from Tsinghua University. It's called a master's in degree in global affairs. Um, and um, for us, it consists of a core curriculum. Uh, the three pillars of the curriculum are China, global affairs, and leadership. Um, and for each of those, we have uh, core required courses. Um, and that ha was, uh, uh, has been revised uh, since the early days of the program. And our new curriculum, our new core curriculum was just launched this year. Um, it consists of a two module course uh, in global affairs. That's a semester long course in global affairs that focuses on current and emerging issues in global affairs. Uh, a Ch core China course called 40 Years of the Chinese uh, um, Economic, Social, and Political Reform, which uh, brings every scholar up to date on the remarkable uh, trajectory of the China um, global rise over the last 40 years. Uh, and then a leadership core, a set of leadership courses, uh, which we'll tell you more about as well. So everyone comes out of the program with those three pillars. In addition to that, we have quite a few elective courses um, that come largely out of the fields of public policy, economics, and international relations. And they, uh, but increasingly, where those elective courses are aimed at building out the new core curriculum on emerging and current issues in global affairs and China's place therein. Um, we also have a, um, uh, uh, a required Mandarin language training um, uh, requirement, which is one module, uh, but we offer Mandarin language training uh, throughout the entire academic year. Um, we have, uh, the, the program is uh, arranged around four academic modules over the course of the year, each one roughly equivalent to half a semester. Um, and over the course of the year, uh, you are required to earn 10 credits from the core courses, which everyone has to take, and then you have eight elective credits. But in addition to that, uh, there are other credits that you earn through the two credits from the Mandarin language program, um, and then we have a uh, practices in global leadership lecture series over the year, uh, which you're required to attend, which also results in two credits to the degree. Um, and then some co-curricular credit requirements like our experiential learning deep dive, which happens between modules one and two, um, and our uh, very in-depth orientation session, which also earns credit. Um, on the academic side, the other uh, important uh, uh, requirement is the uh, writing of a capstone project, the research and writing of a capstone project, which is like an academic thesis. Um, you uh, are required to select a topic by about the middle of the year. Uh, we provide a list of advisors that come from our own visiting faculty um, and, uh, and Tsinghua faculty. Um, and we, um, uh, you, you have to submit the, the project towards the end of the year uh, and then defend it in front of um, uh, an independent panel uh, at the end of the year. 
Uh, and uh, Sheila can talk a little bit more about that. Um, yeah, so I think that pretty much covers the basic components of the academic program. Um, and um, yeah, uh, and Federico, you could move to the next slide now. Um, so let me just say a little bit about our faculty and who they are. We have, uh, we have been very lucky to be able to recruit a really unbelievable set of people to come teach at the Schwartzman Scholars Program. Uh, these visiting faculty, and these are, this, these are an example of some of them. Um, you know, we have about 30 to 40 faculty who come over the course of the year. Our approach is to have, uh, you know, 50% or so to be internationally recruited visiting faculty and 50% or so are Chinese faculty. These provide, uh, these faculty often teaching in the same course provide balanced perspectives on China's, China from China's point of view and China from often from the global point of view. Um, but let me just highlight some of our amazing faculty. Uh, Susan Shirk, who's uh, the chair of the 21st Century China Center, um, at UC San Diego and was the former Deputy Assistant Secretary of State uh, in the Bureau of East Asia and Pacific Affairs, has been teaching a course on Chinese political institutions uh, since the beginning of the program. Gao Xiqing was the former President and Chief Investment Officer of the CIC, the China Investment Corporation. He's on the faculty of Tsinghua's Law School and he teaches a course on basic legal issues and cross-border mergers and acquisitions. You're never going to find anyone more knowledgeable about China and uh, the uh, global regulatory uh, financial world than Gao Xiqing. Carl Eikenberry, former U.S. ambassador to Afghanistan and uh, five-star uh, retired army general, uh, who teaches a course on leadership in diplomacy and security as one of our core leadership courses. Um, Catherine Morton, who is our first permanent faculty appointee and is our professor of global affairs at Schwartzman College, uh, responsible for our new core course on global affairs. Um, she's a global expert on China and global governance. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're really lucky to have her. And this is just a representative of uh, representative sample of the amazing people who teach at the Schwartzman Scholars Program. So next slide, Frederico. Over to you, Sheila. Thanks, Joan. So I'm just gonna walk through a bit more about our core curriculum. So as a master's program in global affairs, a central purpose of the Schwarzman Scholars Program is to form the next generation of global leaders. So each aspect of the Schwarzman Scholars Program offers students the opportunity to develop and enhance their leadership capabilities. So leadership is therefore a key component of our core curriculum and we offer leadership coursework that reflects different professional backgrounds as well as a diversity of personal backgrounds. So within our coursework, each student is required to take at least two courses in leadership, which can be selected from two different types of classes. So one type of class is our five leadership courses, which are full module courses and focus on leadership within different sectors. So we have courses that focus on leadership in business, leadership in the public sector, um, in diplomacy and the military, leading in public crises and emergencies, as well as leaders and leadership throughout history. We have a second group of classes that are our leadership and practice courses. So these are taught by practitioners from different fields and the courses themselves are focused on gaining insight from the experiences of these practitioners. Uh, courses for this coming year include leadership and practice courses taught by Angela Kane, who's formerly the UN High Representative for Disarmament Affairs and the Under Secretary General of Management for the United Nations, um, Tong Min, who is the Counselor of China's State Council, as well as Uni Karunakara, who is the former international president of Doctors Without Borders. Outside of this coursework, the program also hosts a variety of programs within leadership, um, so that focuses on um, during orientation. We collaborate with the Rhodes Program to offer Leading Lives, which focuses on leadership development. Um, and then throughout the academic year, we also offer a series of skill building workshops um, in the past, this has included negotiation, public speaking, and productivity, among others. 
we also offer a number of activities focused on different aspects of leadership. So that has included book clubs, uh, mindfulness, as well as reflection groups that offer and encourage further leadership development. Uh, and then in terms of the rest of the core curriculum, um, as Joan mentioned, the other two pillars of that are China and global affairs. So within China, our China core course is entitled 40 Years of Chinese Social, Political, and Economic Reform. Uh, this year, the course was team taught by Zheng Lu, Debbie Davis, Wang Xiaoguang, and Barry Naughton. Uh, the course focuses on China's development since the opening up in the 1970s, um, and it focuses on contextualizing China's reformation to provide a deeper understanding of China currently, as well as provide a basis for predicting China's future. And then finally, our Global Affairs core course, as Joan mentioned, is led by Catherine Morton. It focuses on current and emerging issues in global affairs, the actors and institutions involved, as well as China's role therein. Uh, the Global Affairs course offers students the opportunity to examine a pathway uh, for this coming year. Those pathways include artificial intelligence, arms control and non-proliferation, inequality, environmental governance and climate change, and global health. And each of these pathways are led by a leading academic in that field. Thanks. All right, thank you. Thank you guys so much. This is a very extensive uh, overview of, uh, of this amazing program and there's so much to cover. Um, so congratulations that you managed to cover that in like 10 minutes. <laughs> That's a plus, <laughs> it's learning for me. There's a lot of new information there even, even for me. So thank you so much. And I wanna pass now to a, a short session of just questions before we move on and I invite uh, the, the audience as well to start asking questions. There's some great questions already being asked, but just one thing that comes a lot in, in the outreach sessions that we're, um, we're used to, to, to do all over the world and people who are, want to know more about the program and two, one very uh, interesting and unique and defining feature of the program is the diversity, not only of the faculty, but the cohort. And the, you know, we have people not only coming from very different personal and professional backgrounds, but with different academic experiences. And so it's two questions in, in one, but first of all, which is a very typical question, how does the, how does the Schwarzman Scholars Academic Program compare to other executive master's programs, uh, like MBAs or MPAs, uh, typically available in, uh, especially in American universities? Um, and also in a way, how do, is the program equally suited for students who are in different academic courses, people who are in the humanities or engineers, or a medical field. So how would you answer those two very broad questions? And thank you again. To both yeah, I, I'll take that one on. And I'll just say that, um, you know, we're not at all, we're not the same as a master's in business administration, a master's in public policy, or a master's in international affairs, or an executive um, training program in any of those areas. We are a unique niche, which is about China and global affairs and leadership. And our courses, and especially our new core curriculum, is directly focused on that. I think in the first couple of years of the program, um, because we had we previously had three concentrations that were international affairs, public policy, and economics, um, we had to deal with that very question, which was, were we offering a competitive degree if you chose that concentration? Um, but we're not. We're not trying to do that at all. We'll never be anything like an MBA the master's in public policy or master's in international affairs. What we are is a master's program that focuses on leadership, China and global affairs. And our curriculum is really about, it's a leadership program and it's about training future global leaders who can bridge China and the world on global affairs in their future careers in all areas. So that leads to the second issue about, um, you know, different types of academic background in the program. That is our largest challenge because it's hard to create a curriculum, um, you know, which presumes a basic level of knowledge on everybody, say in economics or something like that. Um, so our courses, you know, are really focused on um, trying to understand what are these current and emerging issues and China's role therein uh, to the degree possible in, with a, a view towards future challenges and uh, how to uh, understand different points of view as you work through um, you know, the, these global challenges in any field, the cultural field could be the, you know, the, the world of art, 
the art business, uh, you know, any anything that has to do with you know global interaction and exchange. Um, so you know, I I don't we we there's no right background for coming into the program. We've had people who come from Juilliard and do music composing, um, you know, and have no background in the social sciences, and others who come from um, computer science, mathematics, but then a, a set of people come from politics and economics and other types of things, or China studies. Um, you know, I think we're the great um, blending of people with different backgrounds, and that's what's so fun about being in the program. Thank you, thank you, John. And, um, and I, I follow up to that question also, you know, there, there's uh, the question of diversity and how to design a program like that, but also, um, in terms of it's still a new program right so it's a program that is con continuously being improved being evaluated so i think that a follow-up question to that is number one how do you incorporate the feedback from scholars we're now in our um, about to to start our fifth cohort we're just and in the fourth cohort and how how is that being incorporated into the continuous improvement of the program uh, and if you could you mentioned john uh in the initial presentation about the new uh, global affairs curriculum and I know you know from people who are probably watching us today have no idea of all the work that happens behind the <laughs> scenes to make that happen like the people who are consulted the institutions who were involved in discussing that and making this program uh, relevant not only to the students but in a world that is uh, constantly changing so if you could comment on on the course and also in terms of the feedback from that you received from the scholars and how this is incorporated yeah, well, so why isn't Sheila will just take on the, you know, how do we incorporate feedback first, and then I'll tell you a little bit about how we develop the new core curriculum. Sure. So in terms of feedback, we receive a lot of feedback and we have a number of different channels uh, for students to offer their input on coursework in the program so far. So in terms of the academic program specifically, each module, we have a hot chocolate session where students are invited to give insight on the coursework <laughs> so far during that module and any recommendations uh, that they would have for improving it in the future. Um, in terms of student government, there's one representative on student government that specifically works with the academic program uh, and is also a conduit for gathering that input. Um, and then in terms of each course, uh, there are course evaluations that occur towards the end of it um, where additional input is gathered for the specific faculty, the pedagogy, and aspects of the course. Um, so there are a number of formal channels in place, but I would also say that there are a number of opportunities for informal input um, based on coursework and your experience within the academic program. And as Frey and I'm sure Joan will expand on, uh, since we are a relatively young program, we also have the benefit of being dynamic and to respond to feedback each year. Uh, and I would say that we're very intentional about the way that we do so. Great. Well, I'll take on the second one. And just to follow up on that, I often joke that I can't wait until we do the same thing two years in a row. <laughs> 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 but, you know, we are continuously changing and um, and that's good for us. You know, we, we began with a kind of starter curriculum, which was a very good curriculum. But as we've gotten, we've tried to evolve the program to be tighter to the mission and to really just um, highlight our unique niche, which is, uh, as I said, training future global leaders who can bridge China and the world. So on global affairs. And to that end, I think we really had to take on um, you know, what were the issues in global affairs that are going to shape the world in the next uh, 10, 20, 30 years as, um, you know, our young scholars, um, you know, build up their leadership careers in different sectors. So to do that, um, which was super fun, but a lot of work, we organized a series of roundtables around the world with leading global experts. And um, this was a, at least a one year process. It took us, you know, a while to sort of think through where did we want to get and then figure out how we were going to get there. And we had the advantage of being able to, you know, organize these roundtables with leading AI experts, you know, the Dean of Cornell Tech, who's now at MIT leading the new Schwarzman College of Computing, other people leading um, global health, health experts. We organized a roundtable in Seattle on the future of medicine, uh, looking at genomics and other stuff. And we just, we did this in London. We had two or three. We had LSE at Oxford, where we really 
Um, and of course, in China, Tsinghua hosted a roundtable. And we really just tried to gather from the experts, not only what were the major trends and issues that were going to shape the world in the coming decades, across areas like the ethics of AI and other things like that, privacy issues, big data, but also how do you teach it? Uh, you know, how do you teach these things? Um, so that we boiled down and that's, you know, basically the first shot at the global affairs course this year in our new curriculum. Um, and we're constantly refining it, you know, those five pathways, which uh, Sheila described that we'll be offering this year are slightly different from last year, but they represent some of those leading issues. And the idea is to really think about what are the global governance requirements? How, should, how does the world need to work together to solve these problems going forward or to collaborate going forward? So that, that's a little bit about the new curriculum and we're constantly changing, always open for input and especially how to teach it. Thank you, thank you. Yes, it's uh... That's a good good panorama. We, we observe from the outside of the uh, incredible work of the academics team and in devising and discussing that. And I think on the topic of a constantly improving and a constantly changing program too, I wanted to direct a, a question that comes to us quite often as well, which is about the capstone project. It's a distinguishing feature of the program. It is a requirement for all students uh, to graduate from this master's degree. And it's also something that had some changes from years before to this year. So if you could tell us a little bit more about this particular component of the academic program uh, and what it's implied. I know that you presented a little bit in the beginning, but people who are watching us today are a little bit more curious and perhaps some examples of even awarded uh, theses that we had in the past and very diverse um, themes that were explored during this capstone project. Sure, so just to walk through a little bit more of the specifics around the capstone. So it's uh, sort of similar, though unique, to a thesis project um, in which a student works with a capstone advisor um, who is either a faculty from Schwarzman College or one of our faculty partners from Tsinghua University. Um, the capstone itself can take three different formats. So you can either choose to do a policy brief um, a research paper or a case study. Um, and so in the past, um, capstone projects have focused on things as specific as Hukou reforms in Yunnan province um, and as sort of grandiose as US-China relations in space. Um, and additionally, tying this into feedback, um, for this year, we worked with a number of industry partners uh, to offer a group capstone for the first time in which students would work with a, uh, an industry partner on a specific project around a particular question relating to China and global affairs leadership. Um, this year we've had industry partners such as the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, um, as well as VIP Kids. Uh, and so that has been an exciting opportunity for students to work within a particular business or organization on a very tangible uh, project. John, do you want to you want to add something or? Not really. I think there was a question in the um, chat in the questions and answers about uh, how the um, the um, uh, capstone does the does do scholars work with individual capstone advisors to develop their own research project over the years? And yes, the answer is yes. These are individually decided and designed uh, topics. Um, you figure out what you want to work on. We help match you to an appropriate advisor. Well, we don't match you. We just provide a list of all the advisors and their expertise and you select um, and apply to work with them. And um, yeah, and that's how it works. They work with you over the course of the year on your topic. Um, it's totally individual and it's totally based on your own interest. Um, and we've had some really remarkable ones, um, I have to say. Um, I've learned a huge amount. I read many of them over the course of the year in addition to advising them. And I've just learned so much. Uh, um, they're a fabulous opportunity to go deep into a topic um, of interest to you that relates to the theme of global affairs, China and the world. Um, no, that, that's great. I just want to follow up with this. We, we are receiving quite a lot of questions. So I de definitely want to open to, to that. And some of the question relates exactly to the issue of the academic support, not only in terms of advising to the capstone, but also 
uh, the online resources or library resources at Tsinghua. So if we could talk a little bit, if you guys could talk about the what is available uh, to scholars from an academic standpoint is also, I think, interesting for people to know the role of um, the postdocs and the, the assistant uh, faculty who's also at the college and also more broadly the resources available and how to some extent the academic experience at Schwarzman College is integrated to the overall uh, experience at, at Tsinghua University. Uh, well, I can certainly say that, you know, in terms of your chin, you would be a full, fully entitled Tsinghua student with access to the library, the online library and everything. Um, there are quite a few resources available in English. It's a very complete library. We have our own Schwarzman College Library, which is an English language library. Um, and um, uh, yeah, it's just, you know, it's a leading global university with all the resources you get from a leading, a leading global university. Uh, journals uh, and other stuff through library access. We ha also have a postdoc program, which we began in the second year. Uh, we have, uh, last, this current year, we have four residential postdocs who live in the college, uh, internationally recruited, um, who provide, um, you know, support all around, especially to the large core courses uh, for discussion groups um, and, uh, in, you know, uh, focused on that, but also supply, uh, provide support for capstone, offer methodology workshops, and are just, you know, around the clock in-house mentors for the scholars. Um, so that's a, an extra thing. And then for each course, uh, you know, we have, there's a, a faculty and a, a teaching assistant um, that manage the course, sometimes two faculty, uh, sometimes a junior faculty for the core course. Um, so we have a lot of resources. There's a writing support at the college that's offered by the student life team, um, a counseling, um, other types of uh, academic mentoring, the career services program, which you'll hear more about if you're on that webinar, uh, provides mentoring, um, matches everybody to not only an external mentor that, um, a career mentor, um, but also uh, there's an alumni mentor that's matched somebody from a previous cohort uh, who uh, also provides help. So we have a lot of architecture and structure, um, supportive structure around both on the academic side and the career side and in many other ways on the mental health side, everything, um, um, academic resources that, uh, you know, to connect you to. Um, and then of course the faculty live, live in-house with you. The visiting faculty are in the building um, and they are in-house mentors themselves. So we all lead in the same dining room. They're available to you while they're living there. And if you'll never get another opportunity to have such one-on-one -on -one time with the likes of somebody like Susan Shirk or Carl Eikenberry or whoever, including our many visiting um, uh, guest lecturers who are in for a short amount of time, like two to three days or up to a week, um, speakers who come and stay in the building, um, you know, and people you're gonna, you, you'll be able to sit at breakfast with or lunch and, you know, shoot the breeze, ask them questions. So it's, we have a fairly uh, fabulous set of visitors who are always through the college. Thank you, Joan. Just wanna kind of wrap up this part of our, of our presentation and leave it to questions with one, not final, because this is not precisely a question, but it's an issue that is brought up quite often, especially in this day and age. And, and I think it just reiterates the importance and the historical importance of Schwarzman scholars at this point in time, um, but it is the issue of academic freedom, right? When, when, when we, we're talking about this, there, we know that there are lots of debates, but how is this dealt with in the curricular programming, in the academic uh, design and in the management of the program? So if you could talk about this uh, um, a little bit. Um. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, we, we have an agreement for academic freedom in the program and, and we do. Uh, there is nothing you can't talk about within the walls of the college in the classroom. Uh, the faculty are not instructed to avoid any topics. Everybody, uh, you know, talks about the issues as they need to um, and want to, including debating and discussion in every part of the college. Um, so, you know, we have that agreement, but we also follow the Chatham House rule which means that sort of what happens in the college stays in the college. And that's our privilege that we have for the academic freedom that we have. 
Um, so nobody can be quoted by name. Um, uh, you know, um, people's identity is are protected from any comments they make in the college. And obviously, it's China. So you know, um, what people say or don't say, they're uh, especially our Chinese faculty. Sometimes they're navigating the line and careful. Uh, but for the most part, I don't think we see the impact of that at all in any way. You can write what you want to write about in a capstone project, any topic. Some of them are pretty controversial. Um, I think what we do help to do is help to, you know, uh, try to uh, manage the language for anything that has to go into writing and get published, you know, uh, or that will go on to the Ministry of Education website, you know, help sometimes look for less provocative language or uh, without changing anything that's ever written about or done. So we're, we'll help you navigate the space, but for the most part, it's a, you know, very much a, 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 an environment of full academic freedom. Thank you, Joanna. I think it's very important to address this. Uh, we have over 20 questions here. Some are, I'll move on to the questions. Please keep sending us uh, to us. Um, there are quite a few questions that addresses uh, issues of uh, admissions and our selection process and requirements. I will try to leave these to the end. And if I don't answer this in this um, webinar, I promise to get back to you. And again, for everybody who is watching us today, I invite you to visit our website. There's a lot more information there. Um, so focus more specifically and direct to both Joan and Sheila, the questions that are addressed more about the courses, the electives and, and issues that people are, are asking here to, in order, uh, in the order as they appear. So one, one very good question is much, uh, how much emphasis is placed on China's ever growing influence on technology and technology governance in the world? I think, how is this addressed? Do you guys have examples of uh, elective courses or even parts of the core curriculum that address technology governance and global technology governance? Um, yes, we do. We have a course on technology policy in the developing world uh, that we've been offering for the last couple of years, co-taught by our own Dean of Schwarzman College, uh, Professor Shui Lan, who uh, is a leading expert on China's innovation policy, science and technology policy. Um, and um, yeah, so we do, we deal with that. And as part of our new core curriculum, the global affairs curriculum, AI is front and center, uh, dealing with ethical issues and other um, aspects of it. Great. Uh, another set of questions has to do with Mandarin instruction. So if Sheila and John could talk a little bit about how our program works you know, in conversations with our alumni and, um, and current scholars, I think, I've never met with one scholar that didn't really love the course. They all say it's very tough. Uh, and I think I'm answering from an, from an admissions point of view, uh, knowing Mandarin, having any level of uh, knowledge of the language is not a requirement for application. We do have quite a lot of our scholars who um, have never been to China, who have no previous experience in China, who do not know the language, similar to me. <laughs> and, uh, but we also of course have, uh, uh, Chinese nationals and people who are fluent in Chinese, and there's ample uh, opportunities to learn Mandarin. But if you guys could comment a little bit about how the, the Mandarin instruction course uh, works. Um, and another follow-up question to that is whether there are uh, courses in the program taught in Mandarin, which I think the answer is no, but. The answer is no to the second part. But uh, Sheila, do you want to talk about the Mandarin language courses? Sure. So. In terms of Mandarin language, each student is required to take at least one module. So you would take Mandarin language for the most part in your first module at the college. Uh, and while only one module is required, I would say that a good percentage of our student cohort continue to take one, two, or three more modules of Mandarin. We also had a number of students who chose to spend their Chinese New Year, or at least the part of it that they were able to enjoy this year. Um, taking intensive Mandarin language classes around mainland China. So there are plenty of opportunities to engage both at the college and outside of it if Mandarin language is one of your priorities for the academic year. And I would just say that our teachers are really fabulous. It's one-on-one -on -one intensive language training, uh, small classes, lots of uh, dedicated personal attention. Uh, it's an in-house Mandarin language program and it's really fabulous. No, I think, yeah. yeah, there's lots of compliment. And I think if there's an opportunity to 
learn Chinese, and uh, I think there are classes every day, and it's, it's quite, a, quite a demanding program. Moving on, I think they're uh, trying to kind of curate the questions here, but you guys feel free to, Sheila and John, I think you have access to, to the questions, but I think there's um, some question related to the coursework specifically and how rigorous is the, uh, the grading system at the college and how much time people have to devote to classroom, but not only classroom, you know, study base and research base activity. Uh, and I think another way to ask this question, sometimes we receive that on the road that we, people ask us, is it possible to do this program together with working part time or doing another program at the same time, which I, I think it's really not <laughs> possible. It's a really full dedication and full time dedication program. But if you guys could comment a little bit about the the level of rigor and what is uh, expected in terms of uh, coursework and classwork time dedication. Yeah, well, it is Tsinghua University. It's a rigorous academic environment. As I said earlier, it's you know China's top university and very, very competitive to get into it. And they certainly don't lower their standards for the Schwarzman Scholars Program. It's a hard, rigorous academic program. And no, you really cannot do anything else when you're doing the program, plus all the experiential learning stuff that we is a, you know, a, a critical part of our program. So you, know, you will spend a lot of time in classes. It's four modules. And you have to meet the credit requirements for the degree. Uh, from the university. Um, but in addition to that, we really have a fabulously well curated set of experiential opportunities for you, including the deep dive, um, you know, the opportunity for internships, the mentorship program, the capstone research and other ways that you get out of the college. We have a deep dive series, which is full of excursions on a weekly basis around Beijing. Um, and many, many other opportunities for the experiential learning. But you can't hold down a job while you're doing this program. It's a, most mo master's programs in China are two years programs. Ours is a unusual one year master's program, but that means you have to do the capstone uh, so-called thesis, you know, in the same year that you're doing an intensive set of courses. So between the capstone and doing that in the one year, um, plus the set of courses and the other requirements that you have, you, you can't do anything else. So set your expectations appropriately that you will be working hard, but it's worth every moment of it. Thank you. Uh, let's see here. Um, well, there are questions also, and again, uh, I'm trying to target the questions to the people in the academics team. There's quite a very good questions about alumni engagement and how alumni keep engaged in the program. And what I would say uh, as of now is we will have uh, next week actually, uh, or the following week, a, another webinar dedicated specifically uh, in which a member of the admissions team will be talking to someone from the development and alumni team. So I invite you to direct those questions to them. I think it, it will be great to hear directly from the people who do that um, on, a, on a daily basis. Federico, I would just add one quick thing to that sure. about alumni engagement in terms of the feedback that we discussed previously uh, for student input in terms of recommending curricular changes to better reflect student interest. Uh, we also circle back to alumni to update them on the status of the curriculum and any changes that we're implementing for the upcoming year. So alumni are very much in the know about the academic program as well. Great. Good point. <laughs> uh, there are also, uh, in terms of, um, there's a good question here about, I, I think it goes back to the academic culture and pedagogy. So how do you account for the different cultural contexts of learning? Not every educational system uses the same methods uh, of delivery in learning. So lectures, discussion groups, testing, how is that negotiated uh, in the college and uh, especially in regards to a very d diverse cohort? Well, that's a big challenge in any academic institution, but it's a challenge because you've got individual faculty with their own teaching styles. Some of them, uh, you know, very senior uh, who've been doing it for a long time, uh, leading global experts who may be extremely knowledgeable about what they know, but maybe not be so great at teaching it. So, you know, that's the challenge of every university and we're dealing with it as well. Um, we have half our faculty are Chinese 
faculty, um, you know, who come from a different pedag pedagogical system, uh, which is much more lecture, much less interaction, at least historically, but less, you know, changing a lot. Um, and a diversity of international faculty, some who are younger, some who are older, some who have, um, you know, um, different types of teaching experience. So uh, the way we try to equalize it all is with feedback and a certain amount of um, guidance from the academic office on, you know, the, um, that all courses need to uh, work towards uh, at least part, uh, so at least half the course should be discussion. Um, and we have our teaching fellows who break the larger courses down into smaller discussion groups um, so there can be more critical learning. Um, we limit uh, the n amount of, of reading material that can be presented, uh, you know, to each, uh, for each class, uh, recognizing that English is a second language is true from, you know, at least um, uh, 60% of the cohort that isn't the 40% from the U.S. Uh, and, and then we also have a in-house pedagogy initiative. We work with a leading center for uh, teaching and learning um, at a major university to help guide us in pedagogical improvements. We train our faculty, our teaching fellows. We provide teaching tips um, in our uh, you know, faculty newsletter. And we have a variety of different ways in which we strive to improve the pedagogical approach of the cap of the uh, Schwartzman Scholars Program. In terms of small size versus large si large size courses, um, we have about 30, 35 courses at the college, uh, and some of them are more popular than others. So you know, most of them are in the you know probably twenty so range, but uh, some of them are larger. And those in those cases, we provide teaching fellow support and. Uh, you know, strong um, support for breaking down into discussion groups and to make for a better learning environment. Great. We're moving to the end. We have like about five, five more minutes or five or ten more minutes of questions. I'll address a few. That, uh, it's clear that the core structure of the academic program is around China, global affairs and leadership. Um, but what would you say are some of the specific takeaways scholars will take away from the curriculum as they progress through their career. So basically, I think commenting on particular skills, scholars are coming from very different walks of life and in different points of their academic and professional career. But what are some of the core uh, principles, skills, knowledges that uh, scholars take away and use in their careers? Uh, and I think connected to that, the following questions about if there are additional research opportunities for those who are I think in a more academic path and maybe see this master's degree as a stepping stone for a future PhD degree or to work in the academia, if there are uh, additional research opportunities uh, within um, the, the one year experience at the college. Um, well, why don't I take on the, the, the last is, um, I can just answer and say, not really, but you know, I think beyond the capstone, you can reach out and, uh, you know, potentially work with your uh, capstone advisor, or, you know, on further research if you're interested. We don't provide further research opportunities within the program. Specifically, we're very focused on the, um, the curriculum and the capstone itself. Um, you know, what are the takeaways from the program? I think they're the, the, you know, they're what we're, our niche is. I think you come out of it with a huge amount of leadership training uh, which is a hard thing to do. I mean, what is leadership training? But we have a multi-dimensional approach to that, which is, I think, fairly um, robust and uh, fairly unique. You know, it's not only the coursework, which is based, as Sheila said, on sectoral interests. You know, if you're going to be a leader in a public organization versus in a uh, private, you know, company. Um, but, you know, it also provides the experience of leaders in different sectors, plus a lot of personal leadership development. Uh, through personal leadership style assessments, um, through the book club, through journaling, through reflection, through a lot of, through orientation with the Rhodes program, our partner for our orientation leadership workshop. Um, you know, so there's a lot of the, the leadership training aspect of it is truly unique, I would say, and very robust. Um, you come out of it really understanding China, I think, through this new China core course, what the remarkable rise of China you know, since the opening, beginning of the opening up period. No scholar gets out of the college without fully understanding all the 
the pros and cons of that, I would say, the, you know, how it happened and the trade-offs and the way it was done. Um, what does it mean for the world? And then I think also with this new global affairs course, you really understand um, global challenges um, and China's place at the table on those. Um, you know, what are the institutions that work on it and what are these issues going to be? So I think we provide that uniquely. And then I think if you're interested, this goes to the further study for a PhD or something question, right? Uh, if you're interested, you can take all your elective courses in one area, like the previous concentrations. Most of those courses still exist. You take all your courses on the business track. There are many of them in the college. You can, and you can take them around Tsinghua University, all of them in the public policy track, all of them in the international affairs track. Um, those tracks kind of exist only in the sense that there are a lot of courses in those areas and you have freedom as a scholar once you complete the core requirements to choose your electives and focus them. And those will be good for applying if you want to go to business school, you know, to show that these courses are the courses that you took and prepared you in that way. So. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you so much, uh, Joan. I just want to, uh, you probably received uh, the attendees a couple of notes on your chat box. So the first one of them is a reminder and a link to the schedule of uh, webinars that we're hosting in the next few weeks. Some are application um, directed webinars and info sessions open to anybody who is interested in knowing more about the program and discuss application and admissions related issues. There are also uh, the other, the, re the rest of the series of webinar and this schedule will be updated every month. So I invite you all to take a look and uh, direct specific questions that are not uh, to academics to um, visit and sign up for these other uh, webinars. I also share there the, the link to my LinkedIn account. Please feel free to reach out anytime you want. Uh, and I wanted to conclude and, and perhaps uh, invite for the last question, but some thoughts, there were quite a few questions asking how the program and I think how specifically the, the academics team and the academics program has dealt with in the past few months and uh, with the current crisis, right? And with, with the effects uh, of the COVID-19, uh, facts how this has impacted our program. And I think this is an opportunity for you guys to, it, it basically did an impact. <laughs> and, uh, but I, I think to, to give a little bit of a sense of how much has happened in the past few months. And I think the, the response uh, from the academics team in particular was, was superb. I think before, uh, most Western universities were thinking about it. We were already reacting and, and replanning and rede redesigning the, the program. So if you can comment a little bit on that and why we are all in our houses <laughs> talking and doing this webinar. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, Sheila. You... <laughs> <laughs> sure. Or if you want me to, I can do it. <laughs> you can say we've all been working hard since mid-January when Tsinghua decided they were not going to be reopening. Um, you know, for the second semester. So over to you, Sheila. Yeah, so for context, uh, we had, I suppose, the benefit of being impacted much earlier. We are about a month and a half into, sorry, two, two and a half months into our response, uh, we found out that Tsinghua was closed um, and would delay its reopening at the end of January. So our third module began just after the scheduled end of Chinese New Year. So we began our online coursework uh, around February 20th. Um, our module three courses will conclude this week. So we've just finished our first round of online coursework, which has been a very interesting and exciting transition. Uh, and we will begin our module four courses online as well uh, within the next two weeks. Yeah, so we had to do that. We, of course, had no experience really with online platforms because we're the Schwartzman Scholars Program at Tsinghua University. So we had to figure out what to use. Uh, and then once we did that uh, with a lot of help from many um, leading academic institutions around the world, uh, we trained our faculty and our students to use those platforms, put all the courses online, scheduled everything, um, you know, so that it worked in the time zones for our scholars, I think the very first thing we did was get our scholars somewhere safe from wherever they happened to be on the winter holiday break. Um, everybody uh, was, you know, flew home to someplace safe or someplace where they could, you know, hunker down like all of us. And, um, uh, and then, you know, we had to schedule according to all the time zones and the faculty time zones and 
um, which we did, I think, very effectively. We launched on time, as Sheila mentioned, around February 17th, and um, it's been going pretty smoothly. I mean, we have taught all our courses from Module 3 online and about to launch Module 4, and then an online process for the capstone uh, project with uh, remote defense panels and that kind of stuff. It's taken quite a bit of work, though, I would say, and, um, you know, hardly ideal because so much of the experience is the cohort experience of being together at the college. So uh, we're trying, we're doing quite a bit of online programming, uh, events programming uh, through, you know, webinars, through Zoom, um, you know, with some of the speakers we would have had to the college and certainly some sessions on COVID-19 uh, by some leading scholars, you know, speaking from their living rooms, <laughs> like us. Uh, so, you know, we've, we've tried to respond uh, with good programming. Great, Ron, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and just as a reminder, the admissions process, especially the, the global admissions process and the Chinese, um, the admissions process is the same. And just as a basic reminder that the, the requirements for applicants who are Chinese nationals and people from around the world, the requirements are basically the same. It just basically follows a slightly different time frame. So the deadline for applications for Chinese nationals is May 23rd. So it's coming up pretty quickly. And we are just about to launch the US and global application cycle next week. This has not been affected. So uh, pay attention, stay, stay tuned and use this time to prepare your application. Uh, and we have only a couple more minutes. I want to thank everybody. There were some questions again that we, we couldn't cover in this session and I promise please reach out to me uh, independently. And I just wanna thank you to Sheila and Joan and the whole academics team. It's, it's been really a pleasure. If you guys wanna say a few last words before we, um, we end the meeting, but really thank you. Yeah, it's great to have the opportunity to talk about the academic program. Um, you know, and uh, introduce it to you. I think we're really proud of what we've achieved so far, but we're a complete learning organization evolving very quickly. It's the early, still the early days of the program and uh, we operate kind of, uh, you know, in a continuous change mode, which is a good thing, I think. Um, for the academic questions that you asked and which we weren't able to answer, Federico can, you know, we can help reply to those, um, you know, in whatever fashion is the most efficient. So. Uh, sorry we didn't get to all of them and it's really nice to meet you and i hope we get a chance to meet you in person that you apply to the program and um and, you know we get to get to experience this on the ground <laughs> great thank you joan Sheila. i would just add thank you everyone for attending if you have any specific questions or want more information about the courses that we've offered for this previous academic year or the course overview i would encourage you also to check out the Schwarzman scholars website which provides more information on our coursework and our faculty as well all right well thank you everybody once again i think this was a Really, I mean, I enjoyed it a lot. <laughs> I want to apply <laughs> to the program and I can't. Uh, I learned a lot. So I think that uh, we, we, you know, we accomplished our purpose in, in this session. It's really a pleasure to be sharing this uh, with you guys and having the, the inside information that only you guys who work with this every day can provide. Um, thank you again. And well, until see you another time. Thank you. Bye. Bye. -bye. Thanks everyone.